Good morning and very welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And welcome back for, I think most of you were here yesterday for the physics prize. Uh, the Academy met in session again this morning to award the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and we are now ready to announce it. And with me today are two members of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry. On my right, Professor Pernilla Wittung Stavsede. And on my left, Professor Klaus Gustafsson, who is the chairman of the committee. And I am still Jöran Hansson, Secretary General of the Academy. And before we announce the prize, I would like to thank you uh, all for complying with the uh, corona restrictions. We appreciate it very much and I thank you for your understanding. And I would also like to say that we feel that it is important and well worth the extra efforts to keep awarding the most important discoveries and celebrating scientific progress, even under those, uh, these difficult times. Now over to the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. This year's prize is about rewriting the code of life. Årets Nobelpris handlar om att skriva om livets kod. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela 2020 års Nobelpris i kemi gemensamt till Emmanuel Charpentier och Jennifer Doudna för utveckling av en metod för genomeditering. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry jointly to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the development of a method for genome editing. The Königliche Swedish Academy of Wissenschaften has today beschlossen the Nobel Prize for Chemie des Jahres 2020 gemeinsam an Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the entwicklung einer Methode für die Genomeditierung zu verleihen. L'Académie Royale des Sciences de Suède a décidé ce jour d'attribuer le prix Nobel de chimie conjointement à Emmanuel Charpentier et Jennifer Doudna pour le développement d'une méthode d'édition du génome. Korolevska Akademia na Svetsi Regila Sevonia Prisudic Nobelevskiu Premi Pochimi a Emmanuel Charpentier et Jennifer Doudna Zarasvitie Metoda Redaktirovia Genoma. And uh, you have pictures of the new Nobel laureates uh, on the screen. Emmanuel Charpentier was born in Chivisy sur Orge in France. She received her PhD from Institut Pasteur in Paris, and she's currently director of the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens in Berlin, in Germany. And as many of you know, she made key discoveries while working at Umeå University here in Sweden. Jennifer Doudna was born in Washington DC in the United States. She got her PhD from Harvard Medical School and she's currently professor at the University of California at Berkeley uh, in the United States. And Dr. Doudna is also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and as I told you yesterday, the pandemic puts constraints also on the further Nobel Prize celebrations. So we are not requesting that the Nobel laureates come to Stockholm in December to pick up their prizes. Instead, we plan for digital Nobel lectures and a digital Nobel Prize ceremony with laureates participating over video links. We are still working on these events together with the Nobel Foundation and now from now on also with the laureates themselves. And we will come back to you with details as soon as possible. But I can guarantee you that uh, Dr. Charpentier and Dauna will receive their awards before the end of the year and that they will be our guests of honor next time we can celebrate Nobel Week with the traditional festivities here in Stockholm. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Pernilla Wittung Stavsede of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry to make some remarks about the prize. Pernilla. Thank you, Joran. I'm so honored to introduce this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry. 
It's a fantastic prize. Many have been waiting for it, and it's two amazing laureates. To explain their discovery, I will take you from the big scale, things we can see, to the smallest pieces of life that are invisible to our eyes. A human being, like me, is made up of trillions of cells, and thus each cell is tiny, tiny. In each cell, we have our genetic material, the DNA. DNA is long and thin, like a piece of string. That's built up of building blocks called bases. The DNA in each cell contains about six billion of bases placed along this string in a particular order. This is what we call the code of life. From this code, thousands of proteins are made in every cell that then perform all kinds of functions in our bodies. So this year's laureates, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, have developed an elegant system named CRISPR-Cas9, or simply genetic scissors, that can cut the DNA string at one and only one sing uh, selected position uh, among all the billions of bases. The ability to cut the DNA where you want has revolutionized the life sciences. We can now easily edit genomes as desired, something that before was hard or even impossible. Today, CRISPR-Cas9 is a common tool in biochemistry and molecular biology labs. It's also used in plant breeding and for novel treatments of human diseases. The genetic scissors were discovered just eight years ago, but have already benefited humankind greatly. Only imagination sets the limits for where this chemical tool, that's too small to be visible with our eyes, can be used for in the future. Perhaps the dream of curing genetic diseases will come true. Thank you. Thank you, Pernilla. And now, Klaus Gustafsson, could you give us some more insights into the science that led to the Nobel Prize? Yes. <clears throat> So, uh, let's see if we can. So, uh, thanks to the development of new chemical tools, uh, we know today the DNA sequences of a large number of different genomes. But to merely read this information is not sufficient to understand life's inner workings. We also need to have tools so we can change the information and find out about the function. Uh, with the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna has provided science with such a tool. We can now change the genetic information in any cell and any organism, and we can uh, find out the function of the genetic material. Uh, the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, uh, the system, comes from studies of uh, ancient immune system present in bacteria and other microorganisms. So just as we can be infected by viruses, so can bacteria. And when they, if they suffer a virus infection and they survive that infection, then they keep a piece of the viral DNA as a memory. And this is done in a specific region called CRISPRs, where you have multiple small memory pieces of DNA. So this is where the information is stored. But how can this piece of DNA actually defend the bacteria from uh, later infections? Well, in order to do that, you need to transcribe this region. So you need to make a copy of CRISPR DNA and make it into RNA instead, CRISPR RNA. And in the next step, you need to actually take this CRISPR, this CRISPR uh, RNA and you need to sort of cut it up in smaller pieces. So you get small pieces of RNA that, that uh, correspond to one single inf infection event in the past. And how this processing, as we call it, how this sort of cutting up of the RNA takes place is something that uh, Emmanuelle Charpentier demonstrated. She found a new small RNA molecule in the, uh, in, in the bacteria called tracer RNA. And she showed that this tracer RNA would bind to the long form of CRISPR RNA 
And then together with two bacterial proteins, Cas9 and RNAs3, would cut the long RNA molecules up in small pieces. So now there was a piece of RNA corresponding to, to a previous infection. But how could this RNA piece actually protect against viruses? To answer that question, Emmanuel Chapentier and Jennifer Dauna teamed up. And together the two scientists made a crucial discovery. They found that the tracer RNA that Charpentier found a year earlier, the CRISPR RNA, the small piece of CRISPR RNA, together with the Cas9 protein, formed uh, uh, the, uh, genetic uh, molecular scissors. And these scissors would use the CRISPR part of the complex and then search for virus DNA within the bacterial cell. And if there was a match, where the RNA would match the DNA of the virus, then it would cut the viral DNA and disarm the virus. So this was a great discovery in itself, but the two scientists did not stop there. They wondered, could they make this system even simpler? Because now they had two RNA molecules and one protein. So what they tried to do was to fuse the two RNA molecules into one single RNA molecule, which they call a single guide RNA. And then they investigated if this single RNA, together with the Cas9 protein, could actually target and cleave virus DNA in the test tube, and it could. It worked very nicely. So they had now created a simple two-component two, two, two system. But what they also did was that they started to make artificial guide RNAs. They changed the sequence of the CRISPR part of the guide uh, RNA. And it turned out they could actually cleave almost any uh, sequence of DNA that they would like to target. They had created a programmable uh, machinery, programmable genetic scissors that could be used to cleave, cleave DNA in the test tube. A couple of years later, other scientists, uh, or half a year later, other scientists uh, showed that this was also possible to do in, in vivo, in cells. And what Charpentier and Down had predicted already in the original paper turned out to be correct. This was a system that could be used to cleave uh, DNA in any cellular organism. And why is this possible? Well, and why is this important? Well, it's because if you cleave DNA at the precise site, you can use the cell's own machineries to actually change the sequence there. So if you just cleave the DNA, then the cut will be repaired by the DNA repair system present in, in, in the cell. But this repair system is error prone, so there will be an introduction of errors at the cut. And these errors will, in, will inactivate the genetic material there and turn genes off in many of the cases. If you instead would like to change the genetic material very, in a very specific way, edit it, then you can introduce also a short DNA template, this extra piece of DNA with, that, is, that is similar to the region you want to sort of repair and that the repair machinery can use as a template. And in this way, you can introduce specific changes to any genetic region, genomic region. So this is, so what can you use this for? Well, you can use this, 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 this new technology has transformed the molecular life sciences. We can now edit basically any genome and we can ask all sorts of different questions. And it can also be used to fix uh, genetic damage. For example, the damage that causes sickle cell an anemia. You can use the CRISPR-Cas9 system. You can take out uh, hematopoietic stem cells from a patient and you can sort of correct for the mutation and then put the cells back. Uh, the enormous power of this uh, technology it means that we need to uh, use it with great care. But 
it's equally clear that this is a technology, a method that will provide humankind with great opportunities. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, great discovery and a great prize. And now it's time for questions from you. Uh, we are hoping to get one of our Nobel laureates with us on a phone line, but it's not ready yet. So in the meantime, perhaps you have some questions to us in the panel. And remember to push the button on the microphone stand and make sure the red light is on if you're going to ask a question. We had some problems with that yesterday. Who would like to start? Uh, well, if you don't ask now, you won't get the chance later. Yeah, Maria Gunther, please. Yes, this is Maria Gunther from Dagens Nyheter. Did you ever consider to include anyone else in the prize? I'll give that question to Klaus. So, so this is a question we never answer. We are just extremely happy for this year's laureates. Uh, it's a big field. Uh, and there's a lot of good science being done in this field. But, uh, but we have decided this year to award the prize to Charpentier and Doudna, and I can only say that. Yes, David Keaton. Um, thank you, David Keaton, Associated Press. You mentioned earlier that, the, uh, that imagination was the only limit to what uh, this prize and the science behind this prize can achieve. Uh, is imagination the only limit, or uh, is ethics also an important component? Penela? Yeah, that's a good point, and of course you're right. Ethics, laws and regulations are extremely important here as well, and exist already in place and are being developed uh, as uh, uh, Klaus was alluding to. So, yes, I was trying to be brief. I could add to that that uh, there's recently been a commission uh, appointed by, by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States and the Royal Society of Britain, and in which one of our Academy's members, um, Anna Vedel, also took part, that has um, presented some guidelines for use of, of this kind of genetic technology. So there is a lot of work going on, and, and the criteria are being developed by the scientific community. Mm -hmm. Now I think we may have uh, Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier with us on the phone line. Are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Very good. Uh, thank you for being with us at the press conference. We're in the midst of it right now. Who would like to ask a question? Yes, we have a lady over there. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm a journalist from Nordic Chinese Times, and congratulations to this year's winners. Um, people found that many great scientists including 70% of the Nobel Prize winners are uh, believe in theology. Uh, when they face limitation, uh, they pray to God for wisdom. Um, do you believe in theology? Like, uh, do you, like, in addition to doing research every day, uh, do you talk to God? Uh, can you uh, combine chemistry and theology to uh, to do contribution in science. Okay, that was a very private question. You answer it if you feel like it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure whether I understood it. The question is whether I'm, I'm talking to God. Yeah. No? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm obviously, uh, I mean, obviously maybe people don't know it, but it's not a secret I was raised uh, Catholic. Uh, now my, uh, my, my, my religion turned out to be quite much uh, uh, science in the sense that, um, that yeah, all my uh, focus is on, on science and uh, I, I believe in, uh, in uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm doing as a scientist and what uh, science shows us in, in, uh, in terms of, of uh, at least uh, um, how do you say, <laughs> showing us the nice, uh, nice part of, of nature, which is what uh, the CRISPR discovery has, has, uh, has shown. Um, very nice and uh, sophisticated, yet uh, simple mechanism of life that can be uh, used for uh, helping uh, society and humanity. 
Thank you. Maybe it does not answer directly your question, uh, but okay. It was an elegant elaboration. Thank you. Now, Thomas von Heine. Uh, congratulations. Uh, this is Swedish Television Public Service. Uh, we heard, we know that we've been waiting for this particular prize for some years now. Have you been waiting for it, expecting it? Um, actually, what was uh, maybe, uh, I should say, um, not common or, or quite unique is that uh, very fast after the publication of the Nature paper in 2011 and the Science paper in 2012, it was indeed mentioned to me uh, a number of times, maybe uh, more than what I would have liked, that uh, one day, um, yeah, this so-called discovery uh, may be awarded uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, I have to say that, you know, it's something you hear, um, and as much as I have been awarded a number of prizes, it's something you hear, but you, you don't, you hear, but you don't completely connect. <laughs> when Gerhard Hansen called me this morning, I have to say that uh, then I realized that, yeah, I was very emotional, I have to say, because I, I was, strangely enough, I, I was told a number of times, but when it happened, you, yeah, you're very surprised and you feel that it's not real. But obviously, it's real, so I have to get used to it now. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Anneli Megner Arn, uh, Swedish TV4. Congratulations on this prize. Uh, yes, we waited such a long time for it. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what it was like at the Umeå University. I've heard that you uh, stayed up late at night to talk to Jennifer and how you did this together. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, how, it's, uh, how it was working there? Yeah, Umeå was a, a, a great time in my career. Um, I, I will try to not be too long, but uh, at first when I, uh, I uh, announced uh, to my colleagues in, in Vienna and to my friends and family that I, I would accept a, a position of associate professor at the Laboratory for Molecular Infection Medicine Sweden, that is a Nordic partnership um, together with EMDL for Molecular Medicine at Umeå University. <laughs> um, the people who knew me very well wondered whether I was uh, <laughs> clear in my mind because they, they were thinking that um, they were very surprised that uh, uh, I was taking such a decision. As, as, as a matter of fact, uh, I was supposed to go to the Karolinska Institute right after my postdoctoral time in the U.S. This was in 2002 uh, in the lab of uh, Stefan Normark. Uh, ultimately, uh, I went to Vienna, so <laughs> I always had in mind that one day I would <laughs> Uh, I, I absolutely needed to go to Sweden, and, and um, yeah, in 2007, uh, the means was uh, uh, advertising positions, and I thought that it was exactly what uh, I needed at the time of my career, even though for sure it was that uh, maybe uh, uh, a certain um, price for my um, personal life, but once in Umeå, I felt so comfortable. I, I say this because it's, it's, it's part of it. Um, with very nice colleagues, uh, very nice environment, a supportive environment, um, a freedom to do research, a, a sense of, of quality versus the, the, the time and the pressure to just publish for publishing, but the, the, the sense of giving the scientists and even the young scientists the recognition of the ideas they may have, uh, giving them the chance to um, yeah, to, to, to pursue what they want to pursue, even though it, it may be, uh, uh, you know, uh, not that uh, uh, clear at first or excited at first. And, and this it was very, very important for me. This is the reason also why I took the decision to go to Umeo, because I felt that there would be a community understanding what I wanted to do. And the research really started um, 
actually the already in 2007 we had identified a tracer RNA in my former laboratory at the um, Max Peretz Labs at the University of Vienna in Austria. And um, I had my interview in 2007, and I was uh, going, uh, starting to go back and forth in 2008 to Umeo, and this was really during this traveling that I really decided to actually really focus on, on, on CRISPR, which is the research that we had already started in my lab. And um, yeah, and, and, and then uh, it was, uh, <laughs> uh, in a way, a long way to a uh, lot of work and commitment, but uh, results that were so clear thanks to the nature of the CRISPR-Cas9 system in Streptococcus pagenes and other bacteria species. Um, so this was really a, a very unique time. In, uh, for me or so, I, I, I've run a lot of projects myself, a lot of projects are running in my land. This was really specific. Uh, with regard to Umeo after, <laughs> when you live in Umeo, you know that the nights are, are very um, uh, long in the in the winter, and it's very cold, and in the summer, the nights are very short, um, uh, there is even not really uh, night. And um, at the time when we were um, uh, writing and finalizing uh, the manuscript, uh, together with uh, uh, Jennifer Dorna and the uh, team, and and Martin Minek and Christoph Schilinski. Uh, me, I was, <laughs> it was good for me because uh, I was up uh, the entire day and the entire night. I will uh, be leaving at the Umeo time and I will also be leaving at the Californian time. So indeed, uh, I will go back to, to my home at 3 a.m. in the morning, full light, get a few hours of sleep and go back <laughs> to the lab. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm hope people in Umeå heard that. I'm sure they're going to love you even more after that. <laughs> Who would like now? Yeah, I think Maria Gunther was first. Yes, uh, this is Maria Gunther from Dagens Nyheter. Congratulations to the prize. I think we are almost as happy as you are. Uh, when did you first realize what this tool could be used for? I think this actually, uh, it has always been part of my um, if you wish, of my education. So I started as a bacterial geneticist. I started to, uh, yeah, to manipulate DNA in bacteria for the purpose of engineering bacteria genetically already at the start of my career at the Pasteur Institute, and then at the Rockefeller University uh, and, uh, and NYU Medical Center, where actually I developed uh, a genetic toolbox uh, for uh, Staphylococcus aureus and other gram-positive bacteria. Uh, during my, um, one of my postdocs at, at uh, the New York University Medical Center and the lab of Pam Corin, I was also uh, focusing on, on uh, engineering transgenic mice to understand uh, proteins that are involved in cell-cell adhesion and uh, potentially have a role in, in skin diseases because I was interested in understanding skin in eukaryotic systems to be able after to uh, pursue uh, my research on infectious diseases and uh, thereby uh, choosing uh, Streptococcus pagina that is a skin pathogen. At the time, it was in, at the end of the 90s, uh, it was clear that uh, to perform, we knock out one needed to go through mice and that uh, later on on the RNA interference was a way to uh, affect the expression of genes in, in human cells, and after the finger nucleases, talon nucleases came. But for me, I was always having in, in mind and observed that, that one day I, I would be very happy if one could really perform proper genetics. That was always my, uh, uh, let's say, my life motif for the bacterial world, but to be able also to do proper genetics in, in human cells and thereby uh, develop, um, uh, let's say, providing the scientist means to, to uh, develop uh, models of diseases in, in, in human cells that are more relevant to the clinical situation and also provide uh, tools that would uh, allow them to understand better as well uh, human diseases. Uh, having said this, um, for sure, uh, working on, on the CRISPR RNA was also within the frame of 
the idea of working with uh, small RNAs in bacteria, uh, whereby uh, this type of, uh, of, um, of research, if you wish, uh, would always uh, lead potentially to either um, a way to discover uh, new, uh, new pathways that could be useful uh, for uh, developing um, therapeutics against uh, bacteria, um, but also a way to find uh, new mechanisms to target uh, genes and their expression. Uh, and you know that RNA interference are also small RNAs, and a lot of molecular biology tools, in, in any case, uh, originate from from uh, discoveries of enzymes or, or associated elements in bacteria. So this was always uh, in my mind and was always a leitmotiv as well to work on, on CRISPR. And so quite early on, actually, I think, uh, quite early on also for CRISPR, I, yeah, and I do wish that it could be also harnessed to, to treat uh, human genetic disorders. So a vision that was there early on and then matured and modified over time. There, yes. a question here. We have, we have a couple, I think we have time for two, yes. maybe three short mm -hmm. questions and answers before we have to conclude. Please. Thank you, David Keaton, Associated Press. Um, uh, first of all, uh, what potential applications excite you the most today when we look at the implications, applications of this discovery, and specifically looking at new vaccines, potentially for COVID, uh, looking at the developments that are made in DNA vaccines, are you hoping or do you expect to see uh, this research feed into um, applications that could uh, contribute to solving the corona crisis that the world is facing today? So, first of all, um, maybe you have seen that uh, there are some uh, kits um, based on the CRISPR-Cas system and that are uh, available to be able to uh, detect uh, the virus. Uh, having said this, um, CRISPR has a direct technology uh, to cure, <laughs> I mean, to at least, uh, you know, with regard to really uh, being developed as a, as a vaccine, I don't see uh, it um, in a direct way, but in an indirect way, yes. I mean, we are uh, performing CRISPR screens in in, uh, in uh, our lab uh, with human cells infected with SARS-CoV-2, others are, are doing it as well uh, for the, the hope to, to be able to find uh, uh, new components or, or new, uh, new molecules important for uh, the virus to, to replicate and, and cause diseases. And these uh, uh, findings uh, could uh, help to develop a vaccine. So I see it's more with regard to research and development rather than the CRISPR technology itself uh, being developed as a vaccine. Thank you. Do we have, no? I think there was a gentleman here. Yes, congratulations also from me, uh, Stefan Trump from the German news agency DPA. Um, I think that you and Ms. Dutner are the first woman sharing the prize. Um, there, uh, therefore, my follow-up question, um, how excited are you about that point of your prize? Uh, <laughs> I tend to consider myself as a scientist, but surely I'm very happy that, uh, as a matter of fact, for, for this uh, prize, uh, these are two women. Um, I, I wish that this will provide a, a positive um, message to specifically to the young fellows, the young girls who, who, who would like to, um, to, uh, um, to follow the, the path of, of science. And I think to show them that uh, in principle, <laughs> women can also, uh, women in science can also be uh, awarded uh, prizes, but more importantly that um, women in science can also have um, uh, an impact uh, through the research that they are performing. Indeed. I think uh, it's very important in our days, but not only for women. I mean, we see, uh, let's say, a lack of interest of following the scientific path, which is um, maybe worrying. So I wish that uh, 
the fact that uh, Jennifer Dauna and myself are awarded the prize today can really provide a, a very strong message for the young girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for being with us uh, today on the phone line at the press conference, Manuel. And uh, uh, we'll be in touch about the further arrangements. Uh, congratulations again from all of us in Stockholm. Congratulations to your prize. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Are there any further questions? If not, We'll conclude this press conference. There will be interviews in various rooms. You will be shown uh, how to find your way to your interviewee. And uh, be careful and keep the distance when you exit the room. Thank you very much. Klaus Gustafsson, uh, can you summarize this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry? Uh, it's a prize for the development of, of a new method for genome editing. Uh, so basically, it's, scientists have figured out a way in which they can specifically cleave any sequence in the genome. So you know, our genomes, they are vast, they are enormous. Uh, and if we want to make changes to them, which could be for maybe investigating the function of a gene or correcting an error or making a change so that we get the crop with a different sort of type of property, then we need to cleave at one very specific site in order to make that change. And what the scientists that we award uh, today, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dauna, what they have done is that they have developed a, a a scissor or scissors 
that can be used to specifically cleave at one precise site. So it's, it's a programmable scissors. You can program it to recognize a certain sequence. Uh, and once DNA is cleaved at this sequence, then you can use all sorts of different tools to repair it and make the change that you would like to have there. So the thing that they have done is that they found this pair of scissors in, uh, in, in very fundamental studies that they, they did, and they immediately understood that it had this wide set of applications. So, uh, yeah, so, so that's what they have done. It's a, it's a basic science prize, but with great great sort of uh, implications. So do you have an example of where these scissors have been used? So, uh, I mean, if you, so it's eight years ago, they, they were sort of uh, first introduced. Uh, and what we have seen during those eight years is that they have been used uh, uh, in basic science a lot. So there have been sort of this development of new var variants of them. And they are used as a standard tool now all over sort of science. Uh, what we are seeing uh, recently is more and more practical applications. So, uh, and of course it always takes some time because you need to sort of uh, refine the technologies and you need to sort of solve practical problems and so on. But now, for example, uh, there are clinical trials where they try to correct genetic uh, disorders uh, and uh, one example is uh, experiments that are doing with uh, sickle cell anemia. Uh, it's a blood disorder that sort of affects millions and millions of people worldwide and where they can take out sort of the stem, the hematopoietic stem cells, the stem cells that create new blood from the bone marrow of a patient. They can use CRISPR-Cas9 to correct for the mutation and then put back the, the, the cells and, and get positive results. It's still early days, but I mean, this is a technology with, with, with sort of uh, uh, great um, promise, so, yeah. To rewrite the code of life, Yes, you yes. Mm. Which is, of course, I mean, when you say that, rewrite the code of life, I mean, immediately you start to think about the implications of this, because, of course, this is an extremely powerful tool that needs to be handled with great care. It needs to be properly regulated. It needs to be used in a responsible manner. And this is something that also our, this year's laureates have been sort of engaged in that. So uh, when they come, I guess they don't come to Sweden because of the COVID, but, but if you get a chance to interview them, you can ask about that because this is something that um, is very important sort of part of this. Now, it's not something that's completely new to science because, of course, there are other methods. I mean, we have this knockout technology for mice and so on. So, I mean, there are, and there are other types of gene therapies that are sort of being uh, tried out. So there is this sort of uh, networks of rules and regulations and permissions that you need uh, to have and so on. But, but the, the enormous power of this is, of course, something that you need to take into um, consideration. Yeah. Why do you have to consider the ethical dimensions? Of because there are editing? some things that are basically not acceptable, not from a scientific point of view or, and not for, from a sort of moral or ethical point of view. Like, uh, like uh, making inher you know, inherited changes for, for example, um, uh, I, I think it would be very difficult. I mean, this is a part of, of it that I, I don't even want to discuss it because it's sort of it's, it's so negative. But I mean, you can think about uh, the Second World War, the Third Reich, and sort of how they tried to sort of uh, get a certain type of, of of people and breed people, you know, with blue eyes. And so, so, so of course there are these sort of possibilities also, but 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 or risks, I would say. But um, you know, with the, with the proper framework and rules and regulations, I, I think that can be handled. And we just have to realize that this is technology that's here to stay. And uh, we just need to use it in the correct way. And there are many other things also in chemistry. You can do all sorts of poisons and stuff with synthesis and so on. And, and that is not, that is not sort of, uh, something that I would recommend. So, yeah. What was the greatest challenge on the path to this discovery? I think 
So, so I know that uh, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier says that the chance favors the prepared mind. I mean, I guess that's Louis Pasteur, who sort of, and uh, I think what we have here are two very competent and good scientists. And they investigated something, you know, in a very sort of careful and professional way. And, uh, you know, with very high quality experiments and data and so on. And then they made a discovery. So, I mean, and that's often how scientific discoveries are made. I mean, there is a lot of, of knowledge and you have to do what you do in, in a sort of, in, in, in the sort of state of the art way. And you need to be prepared for sort of finding things. And they were all of these things. And then suddenly it was there. So, so, so um, I don't know whether there was any particular challenge. I think the challenge is always to do good science, things that people can repeat and sort of, and, 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 and they did that. And they found something amazing. And to note the surprise, mm -hmm. perhaps. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, the prize was not unexpected, mm. I would say. Yes. Did they expect the prize this year? Uh, so I haven't talked to Jennifer Dauna because we didn't, we didn't reach her uh, on the phone. Uh, we talked to Emmanuel uh, Charpentier, and I, you know, it's difficult for them not to be in, in some level. I mean, they of course, they have gotten every single prize on the face of the earth. So of course, I mean, it would be strange if they don't think that maybe, but, but, but I, I was actually moved to see how happy she was about this. And I think that uh, there is something special with the Nobel Prize, something that we should be very sort of, uh, that we are very proud and happy about. It, it, it's a prize that's been around for a long time. And, and that, that uh, I, yeah, I, I, I think it meant a lot to them. And, and I don't think that anyone thinks that they will get it and it's something that's obvious but uh, so they were very happy and, and that's um, yeah and finally can you tell us shortly what makes you most excited about this year's prize so i think it's all these genetic disorders that we can start to think about and, and that we can sort of uh, treat eventually. I, I, I think it will take a long time before we can start to go into, you know, larger organs like sort of correcting changes in the liver or heart or whatever, but this would just being able to take out these hemat hematopoietic stem cells and sort of correct and help people. And these are, these are serious disorders, I mean, and, and, and lifelong suffering. So I, I think that that's something that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, when we start to see results of there. But I would also say that this has, in many ways, rev revolutionized the, the, the molecular life sciences. I mean, if you look at sort of crop science, for example, and so on, I mean, this is used all over the place. And, and uh, so uh, it's difficult to point to just one single thing. And it's, it's also that the implications in the beginning was, of course, cutting and making this change, but now, this is, this is used as a toolbox almost. You can do all sorts of other things that you couldn't even sort of dream of before. So it's the sort of wide array of applications that are sort of affecting all of us. I, I, think, that that's, uh, I think that's what's exciting about it. It opens a new, new, a new window, a new possibilities that, that we didn't have before, and, and, and that's exciting. Very impressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Klaus Gustafsson. Yep, thank Thanks. you.